Phytonet is, is a strange, strange beast. One day you called me up and said, David, I found this really neat thing. You have to check it out. Yeah. You just threw our DBS away and brought up Phytonet. Now that was a remarkable revolution in DBS with the Phyto ports. They were great. Because I mean, you get a message somewhere without having to make a long distance call yourself. <laughs> The, the feeling was just indescribable. The feeling was actually greater than the feeling that I had when I actually first started the bulletin board, you know? I mean, it was like a feeling of, okay, I really am a sysop. I've been accepted by my fellow sysops. We would literally sleep on the floor in that room waiting for the phone to ring, knowing that we were getting our nightly load of uh, Phytonet info. And it was like, you know, you were always the first person up there to wait, and you would watch the progress meter. It goes, dit, 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 dit. Okay, we're done. Uh, let's see who replied to my message, you know? Uh. Phytonet was really our first um, ability to sort of be in the broader community like um, the internet feels today. I mean, no, Phytonet didn't invent something that didn't exist before, um, but it provided it to a whole new group of people. Yeah, this is just amazing that we can get mail messages around the world and nobody has to pay anything on all these phone calls. <laughs> Fido was, was really uh, what brought bullet boards into the modern era, and so be sure and cover that well. I didn't no idea it was going to become so amazingly large or long lived. That's the part that gets me. Phoenix Software was, I believe, if I remember correctly, the sole subcontractor with Microsoft to install MS DOS on uh, various manufacturers' hardware. I would sometimes just get a board nailed to a piece of plywood with a power supply that gives you shocks, no monitor, and CPU and memory, and an EEPROM socket, and a list of I.O. ports. And I would burn a PROM on my uh, 8086 machine, and I would stick the PROM in, and I would make the screen clear. You know, Then I would go step by step by step and make a machine come up cold. So I had this real concept of hardware-independent device layer. Um, I thought, well, you know, I want to write a bulletin board. I get a spare few weeks. That could be easy. Well, you know, ten years later, it was still not done. But I um, wrote this bulletin board, and it used the I/O layer I'd done for Phoenix. Ultimately, that's how I found uh, Tom Jennings, was because I had this deck rainbow that uh, uh, needed communication software for, and didn't have any. John Medill, I don't know how he, he ended up calling my bulletin board. Um, said, "Hey, I got a deck rainbow. I also don't have an IBM PC." And for the first maybe year or so, uh, all I knew was this, there was this incredibly bright mind on the other end of a keyboard that was typing words to me faster than I could read. It was very painful. He would tell me some data, I would make a binary, he would download it at 1200 baud across the country, a million dollars during the day, and uh, we did this a dozen or 20 times, and finally the freaking thing worked. It was really fun. I mean, it was fun. I mean, I, I remember a lot of uh, anticipation about that first version, but I don't recall it not working, you know? Maybe that's a selective memory, but it just like always worked. And that's one of the things that was amazing about Tom. He, he cut a lot of code, um, and it worked. So there's a bunch of final bulletin boards, and then John and I were just doing so much keyboard chat, you know, sysop chat crap. It was just, it was making me crazy. And it was costing a fortune, so uh, I don't know where I, I caught when I remembered that bulletin board to bulletin board message thing. Tom and I used to talk on the phone frequently. I was, he said I was uh, talking to John Medill and got to thinking about it. He said, wouldn't it be neat if uh, our boards could call each other up, exchange messages, 
uh, maybe exchange uh, files. There was other, there was other talk about this stuff at the time, and I don't recall it. Um, but they were all very complicated schemes. All we must get around this local call business. And I said, that, well, what does it cost? Just what does it cost? Just did the math. It just wasn't a whole lot of money. Basically, in one minute, you could move a couple of K of text or something. So the economics just went that bad. So uh, did the first Fido net. We went through this transition where we went from being Fido BBS to being Fido Net. Tom Jennings had logged in during the middle of the night somewhere along the way, and he'd uploaded a new Fido, another program called uh, uh, Fido Net, and a node list. You're actually watching two machines coast to coast connect, and error checking and resynchronization, all this stuff, and it's like, this is going to be a big machine. It was fun making a big autonomous machine. And suddenly we had systems that could call each other up and talk to one another. How it got spread out after that, because it was just amazing. We went from two to, to I don't know, it seems like 150 in less than six months or some such thing. And it just you know, had a momentum of its own and mind of its own. It just spread like wildfire. When Jennings was uh, running it, uh, somebody would call him up with a change and he'd write it down on a uh, post up and stick it up on the wall. And maybe he'd see it in a, in a week or so and finally get it edited into the node list. And maybe it'd fall off the wall and he'd never see it at all. And his wall was a mass of post-its. How he ever found anything in, in what was on the wall, I don't know. He published the node list whenever he felt like it. So there was no way that you knew that a new node list was available. So Ken and I got together over the phone I said, we've got to do something about this. So I made a conference call uh, with Ken and TJ. Our position was, you've got to give up this chore and let somebody else do it. So he says, okay, you do it. <laughs> The uh, node list continued to grow, and by late winter, early spring of 85 now, we've been in business as a network almost a year. And that's when uh, TJ laid the awful truth on us. He had 250 node limit. Well, we were about 230 nodes at that time. And so we started getting panicky. That's when we uh, started talking about what are we going to do? We're running out of node list space. The node list is becoming unmanageable. It's so big anyway. I took off work. Ken took off work. Tony Clark took off work, and we and TJ, we all came here, and this is the meeting you're talking about. TJ had some maps in his knapsack, and he pulled out a map of the U.S. All it had was the outlines of the states. And Tony Clark and I got down there with the felt-tip markers and started carving out regions. Do you 
you're into trivia here. Do, do you under do you know why the first how the first uh, fighter net regions in the U.S. were created? Um, it was based on the NCAA basketball brackets. <laughs> it was totally arbitrary, really. What we were trying to do was come up with more or less uh, equal populations as best we could guess. We were all prepared for a horrendous horror story when we switched from the amorphous net to the net node concept because we all did it on the same day. That sticks in my mind more than anything else when you know the hatters go from just nodes to net node and how you know they were all so worried about you know we're going to do this at like midnight and everything's going to either work or it's all going to blow up and everybody had to be ready to do the same thing at the same time and you know the good old days. <laughs> I figured oh it's going to be a catastrophe. It was the 17th node on, on uh, the Fido net, and then they went to regions and nodes, and, and so then 107 was the New York area, and everybody had to split off, and since I went down to New Jersey, they had changed my number, and uh, I got upset with that because now it's 107.27. I went, no, no one's going to know. I was an early starter in this, <laughs> and here was my point of pride, you know, that I was one of the early settlers on the homestead. So yeah, I got really, it was a giant, giant, giant ongoing software pro project. It was kind of open-ended. It's kind of fun up until like 92, um, you know, almost 10 years. It was amazing some of the stories that, 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 that I was told. During Desert Shield and they're doing the build up in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, at that point, this is pre internet, uh, there was a, a Desert Storm Fido uh, BBS over there. There was the, uh, we were doing electronic mail to a uh, soldier station in Saudi Arabia. And at the time, this was pretty groundbreaking. The lure of having stuff sent to me and available for me to read when I wake up in the morning from God knows we're on the, you know, on the planet and yeah, it's the planet because there was stuff popping in from other places. It wasn't just local stuff. You know, it worked well. I could send, you know, email messages across the country long before anybody heard about the internet. You know, long before people would email, what's that? Basically for free, I could send a message from here to New Zealand, Australia, you know, New York City, wherever, 
I remember this one guy, he was, I don't remember where he was, I just knew he wasn't on our continent. I would send a message out to him and it would take two days for the packets to get to his BBS. Then he would reply and it would take another two days for the packets to make its way back to me. That was a fascinating thing. You're projecting your presence vicariously out and you have no idea how far it goes. When you get to the messaging alone, there's that two field in the subject area. That's the news groups. This is a news group that has a two field in it. And that, for people, has a bizarre effect on people to look at. First off, they look at it and they think, it's not to me, I'm not supposed to be reading this. Okay? <laughs> but they get explained to them that this is a message that's public. If they wanted it private, they had the option to. So they wanted you to see this. And they thought, well, he did that on purpose then, huh? Okay, and now they want to read because they know that people are seeing it. And that, that little subtlety in there is just tremendous. You could, you could do your own filtering. You could decide which, which echoes you wanted to, to, to view, to participate in. You can lurk in any one you want, not say anything, and then come in to any one you want and then, you know, project yourself. One Tuesday a month, second or third Tuesday of the month, we'd meet. And, um, and get together and it was great because then you could meet with all these people and everybody was a fabulous mind. You've interviewed a lot of these people. There's no idiots out there except for maybe one or two users. <laughs> like, I think like when I, I used to travel a little bit um, and you know when I traveled I usually took my usually took my node list with me because it was like the greatest BBS list you could use that um, and then find local ones. We met people all over the world. We had people come for, visit us from Australia and they took a trip to the U.S. and what they did was they pretty much traveled around and stayed with other sysops. There were organizations that used FIDO as a means for communicating within uh, different locations in a company. Uh, and it was a real cool tool for, for businesses to use at that time. If it, was a, you know, if it was a relatively small club of 100 people or 1,000 people that went on for 10 or 15 years, it'd be one thing, but it's like this huge nebulous, swirling mass of chaos. And when people send me email, it's like from some area I never heard of. Like if there was a whole, if it was about a year and a half and I was getting email from .ru domains about FidoNet stuff in Russian to English dictionary language. You know, just, it's kind of, and Russian is just a complicated language. It doesn't translate well. So it's was like, I didn't even know what they were talking about. But it was flattering. It was, you know, it was generally good. They were asking questions and if I could answer, I'd answer. So just these, you know, so clearly FidoNet was having a little mini something or other in uh, .ru land, and uh, I don't know what it's about. Just a, f a few months ago, I heard from a doctor in Vietnam, and he said, you know, all the fancy stuff of the internet and, and all of the, 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 the rich collection of information on the internet, but that's censored in Vietnam by the government. But phones are not. And he said, do you know I get HIV information that is the latest and the best HIV information anywhere on the planet? He said, and I get that through BBSing because they don't censor the telephone. So they can shut the internet down, but there's still a way in. And he said, thanks. You know, without, without Fidonet and Opus, uh, a lot of people would be dying that aren't dying, so that's cool. You can. Tom is a fictional character that I've read about on the internet and uh, in the Fido news. Uh, the deification of Tom? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say... Well, sure, everybody thought that Tom was the god of... Tom, Tom Telecom. And, yeah. It's really kind of interesting, but uh, we're, we're, we're definitely in a situation where Tom was the creator. Uh, and you can look at that from a religious or a spiritual perspective, or you can just look at it as he was being creative, and he created this thing that had a life of its own. You bet. And when you got to meet him, I mean, you know, he was so aloof, just because he's a character. I mean, you figure that out after years, you know. Tom was this uh, incredibly uh, admired individual that put a lot of time into doing something that he believed in 
Now, maybe it was just for the excitement. Maybe it turned into something. Maybe, maybe what everybody thought it was for Tom was nowhere near what it was for him. And, and I imagine that that's probably the case. I guess everybody really has their own view of, of the, quote, Tom Jennings dream. He did a lot to promote that messianic image. Uh, now, you're talking to him, and this is 20 years later, okay? And we've all hopefully grown up a little bit. Uh, or changed in a number of ways, but there was no stronger supporter of the messianic image of TJ than TJ. Right. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely chaos. <laughs> you know, it was it was like, yeah, I'm saying this. Let's hear the applause from the wings. That's what I'm saying. You know, and uh, and and Lord Lord Love, he deserves kudos for what he did. No question about it. His his idea was we are in Vitonet to communicate. I don't think Tom wanted to be the emperor of anything. And I think he'd probably be amused by the idea of people coming to him saying, Oh, Holy Father, we want you to rule on something for us. Everybody's going to have their view of what Tom Jennings' dream for Vitonet was. I think really his dream was, in a nutshell, communication getting people to communicate. And I think if you really want to boil it down a little farther than that, I'm not really sure that he had a dream. I think he just had a, an idea that this would be fun to write this software. It just gets used to justify any old thing, which is kind of flattering that I have this apparent power. In fact, you know, send me checks, everyone send me checks. So there was this net node thing, uh, the region, the linguistic error I made was calling it a region with the idea that nets are encompassed in the region. Rather than just being a logical entity, they were taken to be political boundaries. And this gave them this de facto position to assume geopolitical power over sections of the Phytonet. And that started in 84, and was, as far as I'm concerned, the goddamn fucking ruination of Phytonet. The political conniving over region stuff. And the little petty things, oh, petty dim-witted bulbs. I still get mail from once in a while. The technology is easy. It's the politics that's hard. There was this whole political side that just, whoa, yeah. <laughs> I have approached people in the past, hey, how about fighting that? And they're like, ooh, too much politics, too much fighting. It, it's the same crap that's been happening ever since Tom created, basically, the second node out there. I mean, the politics have been going on since day one. And it's just... It's just people that are trying to do their own power plays. It's, it's, it's sad that they're taking a really nice technology and distorting it to their own means. Fidonet was a good thing. I really enjoyed being associated with Fidonet. The politics killed him. Uh... Instead of getting something accomplished and done, when you put something on the floor, everybody else wants to be part of it. And the only way they feel they could be part of it is by trying to make that thing better. And then you get involved in a bitching competition about how it should be done right. Nothing ever gets done at all, and all that's left at the end of it is just a whole bunch of bitterness. When you have a small group of people, everyone knows, you know, and you might have, we might have foibles and differences, but I can see you're working on this, and so things sort of work out. But when you get to the point where you have people who don't know each other, then you get to the point where people perceive that there's an inside and an outside, and they're not inside and people, things are being done to them from the inside and then people scream and yell. Whereas if you would have said, we're doing it this way, this is how we're gonna do it, you people make it work, would have been much better. But no, they, they could never get themselves to commit to paper on something. Oh, all the nights you sat there after sending flame mail to somebody, you know, oh, I don't want to coordinate with you anymore, you suck, bing. And you'd watch as the pat, and you would you would do a force drop, right? You would force the upload to the node immediately, and then you'd sit there and you'd wait and you pull the node, pull the node, pull the node, and then Bing, it would come back and oh well, you're an idiot and you have snakes in your bathroom and yeah, you'd sit there, and you'd it, it was so funny to watch. I mean, now it, you look at it and it's ridiculous. 
Uh, but in a region, you would have little hot spots like this, and every now and then, like uh, the Pittsburgh sysops would all be screaming, yelling mad at their NC, and like, I have no idea why, what's the big deal? Does the mail get through or not? <laughs> it either does or it doesn't, who cares? Then it just sort of started to become so much flamage. It was like you never were doing anything right. But eventually it became almost a battleground where, well, you can't get it right, but I know I can, and then sort of everyone wanted it. Uh, then it got into, well, we run the right BBS and they run the wrong BBS, so we need you to kick them out. Private individuals, most of whom had real jobs for real companies and did this in their spare time at their own expense, you know, with their own money and didn't have time to mess around with all this political stuff. You know, because I want to be able to turn my computer on and I want my email to go and I want my news groups, and I want my echo mail, and that's what I want. And I don't want to I don't want to deal with the rest of this stuff. You know, the day my computer stops working and then maybe I'll get involved. We're not gonna agree. We don't need to agree. The protocols have to run. That's all. We're never gonna agree. Um, we shouldn't have to agree. Technically the stuff works and if you want to spin off your own network, that's just fine. But the rest of it, you know, he doesn't give a flying flying fuck about the politics of fighting any longer. I bet he's disappointed in in how things turned out. Do you think so? I mean, if he were if he were not disappointed, I think he would still participate. It just has to follow these minimal standards. The rest of it, I couldn't give a shit. Who, how, what bad thing they did, whether they're Nazis, Mother Teresa, you know, I just don't care. And it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. The whole IFNA debacle, it's a very sore point amongst a number of people. IFNA was originally uh, TJ's idea. In fact, he coined the phrase. He came uh, up with international it. <laughs> he Atlantic came up with it. I, I tell people that. It was our own doing. I was fully uh, responsible along with Ken Kaplan and all that in hindsight of doing this IFNA debacle, which I'm sure you, you will hear to no end. Back in 84, he was talking about an international flight on that association. And he wanted it uh, so that he could distribute t-shirts and bumper stickers. Right. And that's about all he could think of right. to use it for. We said, we need to be represented. We need to have a little technical appearance in the, in the technical world. And uh, as a group buyer of, you know, who the hell knows what, uh, you know. IBM PC insurance, you know, whatever the hell the idea is at the time. We'll have this International Fighter Net Association. Uh, we felt that we needed some voice out there. We needed some sort of lobbying voice or, or at least some voice that we can bring to government and say, we're out there, this is how it works. You don't need to necessarily recreate laws for this sort of stuff. Why do we need an IFNA? The answer was, so Ken and Ben could legally accept money to help support their efforts with fighter. Ken, yeah, well, Ken's phone bill at that time was monstrous because he was pushing the node list right. out. Ken filled out his taxes and uh, his accountant told him he was going to owe taxes on all the money he had collected in 85. He was screwed twice because his accountant told him that donations would count as income, but the expenses wouldn't count as expenses. It's, it, it wasn't a huge amount, but it was a non-trivial amount, I'll tell you. <laughs> and it was insult to injury. And uh, Why the report is income. Exactly. So uh, <laughs> that, that was one thing that you know, suddenly, and he's already collected a fair, he had already collected by April uh, as much in 86 as he had in all of 85. It was basically structured so that money could be given in, so that the people who were putting out lots of money for their hobby wouldn't have to put it out. It would be taken care of so that those central nodes, would, the modems, would be given to them. 
but we needed an organizational framework in which to do that. And conventionally, that's a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. So that's what we did. That was the beauty of it. Like, wow, we don't have to charge you for this. It's not even like an ISP to get on. We won't have to charge you. It's like, but we have to have this rule book because otherwise they won't give us this classification. Then corporations will just give us stuff. I spent all the money that came into IFNA. Uh, I was, you know, one individual. I had one P.O. box. I was spending it on postage. I was spending it on, you know, some of it uh, Phone calls on, on a corporate, you know, corporation. I was doing absolutely nothing except for going out of my way to try to cross my T's, dot my I's, and do everything to properly set this organization up. Uh, it, it was something we all agreed on, and unfortunately it got bastardized very quickly after it, it got taken over because everybody thought, feared that this was going to be some organization that was just going to, to uh, destroy Fidonet. I got just absolutely this guy is stealing money he is you know gonna send everybody down uh, the tube and he's taking uh, phytonet with him i think they saw ken kaplan and these guys say ah he's a good guy he can be in he's a bad guy i don't want him in you know it's horrible it's miserable yeah, they, we don't want it we, yeah, we, hate we it. want it we wanted to steal phytonet yeah. we had created phytonet <laughs> We presented this idea of the, of the IFNA, voluntary association, but we blurred some lines. We really fucked up. It would also manage the node list. Mm -hmm. People saw in this, probably rightly so, the seeds or the roots for future, quote, takeover of Phytonet. So there'd be this, oh, well, nice and all well-meaning IFNA that controls the node list. And then if they decide to charge money later, you know, you've basically commercialized Phytonet. That wasn't the goal at all. That really wasn't the goal. Everybody had, had been able to think about it because I guess they'd announced before this meeting that this was going to be the big organizational meeting of the IFNA, and they'd left people alone way too long to think about what that might mean. And they had already decided not only how horrible it was, but specifically which evil, foul, universal crime against humanity it was going to commit. And when they stood up there, I, I don't think anybody was more stunned than they were. What happened was it blew up in front of us. We were like shocked. People are screaming, we're being railroaded, blah, blah, blah. And then, it, once that polarization hit, which was within 30 seconds of the first meeting to discuss whether we should do this and, and, and whether this was the way to do it, it just, it, it was spiraling out of control from that on. It was a whole horrible mess. We didn't understand what was going on. There was just no, no good way to please the, uh, the masses. So IFNA was, a nice idea, ill-conceived. I think on our side, people been, uh, might have been less altruistic than others. So IFNA, once formed, chugged along under its own inertia. By 86, I think in 86, I did the big embarrassing debacle on the, on the podium. Um, it was very stressful and a painful day. Yeah, he was not a happy man that weekend. <laughs> but where basically we said, you people are fucked. This if and this stuff. They actually, this was the classic animal, you know, George Orwell's Animal Farm. It's like the third or fourth Fidonet conference. And everyone was just a bunch of dorky sysops, right? All a bunch of flabby white guys and 5% women. And, um, we're in some banquet room for this conference, which is very heated. There's all this stuff. There's this evil lawyer involved. The the guy who was running the uh, conference was a lawyer from Denver, 
and he kept making speeches. And every time he opened his mouth, he made things worse. Basically, so that we went to this banquet room, everyone's like, well, this different thing is getting to be really bad. We walk in, there's all these tables, you know, standard hotel banquet stuff, and then there's a little raised platform with a long table and chairs on it for the different aboard. <laughs> Uh, as, as for the raised dais, uh, uh, nobody did that deliberately. It's just the way the hotel set things up. So all of a sudden, it was genuinely us and them. And it's like, okay, you said you weren't going to do this, and you did it. They did it. And I was on the board. They wanted me to go, and I simply refused. I said some horribly disparaging thing about it, and other people were up in arms. And then poor Ken Kaplan, because his his heart was always in the right place and stuff, always. Poor Ken Kaplan said, uh, 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 okay, that that's all, and it just collapsed into chaos. This lawyer, he wanted to simply fully commercialize Flatternet, period, pay to play. He wanted to charge people to be in the node list. He took me aside just before this meeting and said, you know, we're going to go into this and we're going to have some vote. I forget what the issue was. We're going to have some vote on whether you have to pay or something, whether you have to be a member of IFNA to be in the node list, the pivotal point. And this is up in his hotel room. He said, we're going to vote for it. It's a done deal. If you go along with it, being me being me, um, it'll all happen smoothly. If you go, well, well you know, it's going to happen anyway. So it'll just be a lot of trouble. And I basically, I didn't, I should have said, fuck you. I didn't say fuck you, but I virtually said fuck you. I said, I'm not going along with this. And then I went downstairs and didn't go along with it. And then it, that's when legal action started. It was fairly easy for a small number of people to wreak a large amount of havoc. And it's easy also to lose perspective on that and realize that on a large scale, the network crawled on. It breaks up into little pieces and it reforms and it doesn't really matter. Because underneath there, there's people who are using the network technology to do something between us and there's this raging lunacy over here and they just don't have to look and pay attention to it at all. So that's what, that was its saving grace. It just runs in spite of the idiots. Yeah, well, I know when, when Ken, and I call it a disappearing act, even though it really wasn't that, but when he just, you know, pretty much had it, um, I always wondered if he was bitter at the end. I mean, he got screwed. But then again, they all did. That's the reason I burned out so early is uh, I am not and never really was a bulletin board this up. What I was into was the technology, the creation of technology, the advancement of technology. That, that's where I got off. And uh, when that started to wear out or slip away or whatever it did, I began to burn out. What I found is that I was competing for Tom's time when I talked to him about uh, concepts and what have you and at, at one point I just realized that I, I had to let it go because fighting for fighting for space in this wasn't wasn't uh, what I had in mind you know my involvement was pure curiosity and pure adrenaline and uh, pure excitement so when when it stopped being those things I I fell out of uh, out of that those jobs are thankless jobs and yeah, you know, a lot of times you don't get the praise until you leave. It's so nutty, and you sit there and you're getting cursed at, and you're not, I'm not an evil guy, I know I'm not, what the hell? Are you? And they eat you up, it's like you're sitting there and I, all of a sudden I realize, you know, my wife divorces me because I'm always on the computer, but I'm on for these stupid conference things trying to straighten, you know, and explain myself over and over again. And, what am I doing this for? This was supposed to be a nice hobby.
and uh, you know whenever you throw up your hands and say oh man I quit I'm so tired of this blah well you can't leave you're the greatest we've ever had you know really <sighs> you know why didn't you tell me that you know back then you know why do you wait until now you know well we let fight on it go uh, we you know I mean we made sure that whoever we handed it off to was someone who was going to keep it going so I know uh, I mean, when I walked away from it, I knew that, you know, maybe these guys weren't going to keep it flying for as long as I did. But it kept going. That's, that amazes me more. I found out just recently that Phytonet is alive and well. And I think as Phytonet is in 2002, um, we obviously probably have a, a more mature user base and uh, mature, at least in, in years at the very least, um, membership. The folks that are involved with it now, yes there can be some parallels that some folks might draw to ham radio or other hobbies that have been around for a while. We are a dwindling breed, uh, but we're stubborn. Uh, I look on that as a, as a as a badge of uh, perseverance, and uh, and I still find value in it. Do you think there'll be a fight on that in ten years? Absolutely. What it looks like, I don't know, I, and I'm not even going to try and predict. It'll be smaller, I would bet, but yeah, there'll be a fight on that in ten years. Um. My thanks to Tom Jennings for writing Fido Man. I mean, that was brilliant software. The concepts that he worked into that were just great, wonderful stuff. It taught me that you can't have, I was an anarchist and an anti-war and everything, and after that, I understood benevolent dictatorships. It was the great irony of FighterNet. FighterNet was that Tom Jennings was an anarchist and believed in everybody should just do their own thing, but he, designed this networking technology that required a central authority to say who was in and who was out. <laughs> People say, oh, FidoNet peaked whenever it had 30,000 nodes, you know, and all and growing. And then it started dying off. Well, yeah, that's true. You know, I mean, you can't argue with history. The history book is written. You can go back through the node list and see this. But on the same token, I don't see that Fidonet has totally peaked. Fidonet started out as a couple of computers with software that really didn't exist that was being invented. The software has evolved constantly. So I don't know that really Fidonet has peaked yet. It's nice to build something that lasts longer than you do. Well, I don't know if it will, but it lasts longer than your current uh, attention span. It's like, oh, oh, that's still going on? Oh, oh I don't know. It's like, oh, I left the stove on, the water's still boiling.